We're back to discuss Absalom and Absalom, and Miss Chillick will discuss Chapter 3 in a few moments. But first, I want you to look at a chart to get some idea of these relationships. So please look on the screen, and I'm going to show you some of these charts. First of all, you realize that Goodhue Coldfield, the father of Ellen Coldfield, and the father of Rosa Coldfield, is the gentleman who owned the dry goods store, owned, owned the uh, uh, store. Thomas Suthpin, of course, is the figure who marries Ellen Coldfield. And their children are Judith and Henry. Goodhue Coldfield has his wife, whom we only know as Mrs. Coldfield, and his aunt. This is the woman who went from house to house trying to get people to attend the wedding. Thomas Sutpin is married to Eulalie Bond Sutpin. This was the liaison that produced Charles Bond. And it's Charles who wants to marry Judith. Henry won't allow it. And he kills Charles Bond. The slave Clyde is Clyde of Nestra. She is of the same generation as Charles Bond and Judas Sutpin and Henry Sutpin. And we understand that the three of them are together in the house. Clyde, Judith, and then Rosa is with them after Henry disappears. Henry, of course, has not disappeared. He is hiding in the house. When you move over to Quentin, General Com Compson is the patriarch of the family, and Mrs. Compson and Mr. Compson have given birth to Quentin. Quentin listens to Rosa's story, and then he commits suicide. His friend, Shrev McCannon, I made a mistake earlier and mentioned a different name, his friend, Shrevelin Mechanic, is a man who becomes the medical doctor uh, after serving in the service. So here are your relationships. Quentin, son of the Compsons, and the grandson of General Compson. Rosa Coldfield, Ellen Coldfield, daughters of Goodhue Coldfield, beholden to the aunt for trying to make the wedding a meaningful ceremony with a lot of people. Thomas Sutpin, of course, has come after a marriage to Eulalia Bond Sutpin and after having fathered a child, Charles Bond, now fathers two children, Judith and Henry. And when it becomes aware that this, young, this man with black blood is interested in marrying Judith, the issue of miscegenation offends Thomas Sutpin, who has already left this woman for that reason, and he forbids the marriage. But after the war, uh, it will go on, and that's when Henry takes the action and kills Charles Bond. Those are the major events, and we'll follow them uh, as the story progresses and as we keep unfolding these cabbage leaves. Now I'd like to call on Miss Chillick who will discuss chapter 3 of uh, Absalom and Absalom. And after her discourse, we'll conclude tonight's sessions with discussions of chapters 4 and 5.
thought it was funny of um, Dr. Rothman to show you the genealogy because that's exactly what I had done also in the chapters that I'm uh, talking about, chapter 3 of Absalom, Absalom. I had gone through and basically came up with my own little genealogy of it. You can see that. There we go. And it's basically what he had said. And these are the main characters that we deal with in uh, the chapter 1, 2, and 3. Mine being chapter 3 that we're going to discuss. So I would recommend for everyone to do this because it really did help me kind of tie together who is husband, who is wife, who's the child of who, who <laughs> Thomas Sudfin kind of uh, connects with. And it, it really put it together for me as well. So this would be a very good idea. Um, what I would like to start talking about is um, the title of the work is Absalom, Absalom, Absalom by William Faulkner. It was published in 1936 and the exact date being October the 26th, 1936. And in this, there were uh, many mixed reviews. So we as a class are not the only ones who had trouble reading this novel so far. Um, Clifton Fadiman of the New Yorker called it boring. And Times Mag Time Magazine's uh, reviewer pronounced it unreadable. So we are not the only ones who have trouble with this. And, uh, you know, if you're having troubles, please do not feel like you're alone. It is hard to read at times. And later I will share some pointers with you to help you in your further study of this novel. Uh, there is some different historical background events that I thought were interesting. Um, Faulkner's land of North Mississippi was home to the Chickasha uh, Indians in the early 19th century. They appeared briefly in the novel where their only role is to surrender their land and then they silently disappear. We don't really hear anything more of them in the novel. In the 1820s and 1830s, the state and the federal governments pressured most of the uh, Chickasha, as well as their Choctaw neighbors into leaving Mississippi. And then when the fertile uh, Indian country was opened up for settlement, the whites poured in, mostly poor folk from other southern states. As a result, the 1830s were boom years, was a boom years for the uh, state of Mississippi. And after the boom years, the next decade changed. By the 1840s, 52% uh, of the Mississippians were black slaves. The popular image of Mississippi as steeped in a long, gentile uh, plantation heritage is a myth. It, until no more, uh, no many years and before the Civil War, white settlers thought of themselves as Westerners, not Southerners. When war broke out in 1861, most whites worked on small farms, and few plantations were uh, more than just a generation old. Uh, cotton was, you know, as Dr. Rothman had said, the main cash crop, but it still amounted to a minority of the agricultural productions. And many whites opposed succession and war, not only farmers who often had no, more, had no slaves to defend, but also the large plantation owners who often held investments in the North and who understood the North's overwhelming economic and numeric su superiority. And then also uh, by the... Uh, in the mid-1870s, the racist whites won back control through violence. And then by the 1890s, white racists took away the black political power through biased poll taxes and literacy tests that were biased to the black population. And then the title of the work um, was interesting. It alludes to a story out of the Old Testament about David and his son, Absalom. And... Um, King David's son Absalom took up arms against his father. Absalom's forces were defeated by his father's soldiers who were instructed not to kill his son. When the soldiers caught Absalom, they forgot their orders and they speared Absalom to death. And then the king cried out, O oh, Absalom, my Absalom. And so that's how one part, one thought on how uh, William Faulkner got the title of this novel. And I also had some different dates in William Faulkner's personal life that I'd like to share. In 1930, Will, uh, Faulkner bought a rundown mansion 
restored it himself and named it Rowan Oak. And I thought that was kind of interesting how there is a Sudfin who has a mansion in the story. And then in 1933, Jill's daughter Jill was born and Faulkner learns to fly and buys an airplane. And then in 1935, his younger brother Dean dies in a plane crash while piloting the plane Faulkner gave him and then Faulkner supports his brother's wife and child. And then in 1936, his novel is published. I had found uh, two of the major uh, characters that I was very interested in. The first one is uh, Thomas Sudfin. And I thought it was very interesting how he arrives out of nowhere with a group of French-speaking black slaves, and, and we don't really have any history of him. We don't really know where he came from and what he is about. He just appears. So he has a lot of uh, suspicion about him from the townspeople. The questions come up of where he gets his money to buy his 100-acre mile tract of land and to build this nice, big plantation house. The townspeople are very curious, and I am very curious also. And then his own little personal habits attracted attention from the townspeople and attracted my attention when you know he has this uh, Spanish gold and I'm very curious of how did he get that Spanish gold. So that, that kind of got me to where I would like to investigate that and kind of trying to come up with some ideas on it. And then we have Miss Rosa Coldfield, who, as we had heard, is a daughter of a good Hugh Coldfield. She was born in Jefferson in 1845, and she is the sister to Ellen Coldfield, who later marries Sedman, as we had heard. And she, uh, Miss Rosa, is born much later in her parents' lives. Her parents, um, we hear in, in the start of chapter 3, that um, they had her very late in their lives. Um, and she, in fact, is much younger than Judith, um, who, is for her, who is Ellen's daughter, who is actually Miss Rosa's aunt, I believe. Yeah, aunt. And so she is, you know... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Rosa is Judith's aunt. There we go, there we go. And so um, you find out in the start of Chapter 3 that her parents weren't too happy about having her. They were kind of happy not having any more kids, and then she came along, and so, and also the mother died during childbirth when she did have Miss Rosa, and we hear about this in the start of the Chapter 3. And so there's a lot of, bad thoughts there about, you know, Miss Rosa being born and the mother dying and then the aunt takes over raising her and it is interesting in there to find out that the aunt is um, much like a father and a mother image to Miss Rosa instead of the father, Mr. Uh, Goodhue Coldfield coming in and being a, this nice strong father figure, we don't have that. We have the aunt being the strong father and mother figure. And then we also have Miss Rosa Coldfield uh, seen as alone, without any husband, children, or family. And then she doesn't, it, it did mention in there that she doesn't have a sense of housekeeping. Well, I can go with that with her. You can put me down for that too, because I don't either. But <laughs> and then she has a breathless, outraged, emotional quality to her speaking. She has a lot of anger, just as Dr. Rothman had said, for Sudfin. And we see that in her. And then also, um, as we go through chapter 3, she's not the one that is speaking. We start to see a new speaker, a new narrator who comes up, and this is uh, Mr. Compson, Quentin's father. He's the one that is talking in chapter 3. He's the one that is giving us the details. So we start to see a different version. It's not Miss Coldfield, Miss Rosa. Uh, mad, outraged, just angry, we start to see a different perspective and sometimes that <coughs> might change the way we see things. Here are some of the specific events that happen. The chapter begins with Mr. Compson talking to Quentin on the front porch, discussing with him what, what he knows about the story, what he knows about Miss Rosa's. And then also Miss Rosa moves out to Sedpin's Hundred to live with Judith and Clyde. 
We also learn information about Miss Rosa, such as her birth and what I had just gone over, how the aunt raised her and how her life was affected by the aunt. And then we also start to see Sudfin's character examined deeper. And this is done through other people, such as through Mr. Thompson, such as through uh, Miss Rosa's account of him. We start to see some new details of, of his life. And then also we get an idea of Judith and Henry's characters, which get examined in this chapter. We start to see how uh, Judith, how she and her brother compete against each other in the family. And then we also start to see foreshadowing, for, excuse me, foreshadowing in the chapter of events yet to come. That is one of, um, I, I feel that is one of Faulkner's main things that he does so well is he foreshadows many things. You see, he t gives you effects without the causes. He'll give you things that happened. You know, what we hear in chapter 3, we hear of uh, Charles Bond dying. We hear of all this, but we don't know how. We have no idea how. That's what he does. He gives you little bits to get you interested, and then he goes back. And he leaves out those nice little details that we don't know to kind of keep you hooked. And then uh, we see the corruption of Ellen, Ellen Coldfield. We see the pain that she deals with with Sudpin living with him, dealing with his different habits. And then we also start to see the apocalypse of the Sudpin family. It starts to unfold for us on page uh, 58 of our book. And I was going to go to that and kind of read a little bit if you would like to follow with me. Because the time now approached, it was 1860, even Mr. Coldfield probably admitted that the war was unavoidable. When the destiny of Sudpin's family, for which for 20 years now had been like a lake welling from quiet springs into a quiet valley and spreading, rising almost imperceptibly, and in which the four members of it floated in sunny suspension, felt the first subterranean movement toward the outlet, the gorge which would be the land's catastrophe too, and the four peaceful swimmers turning suddenly to face one another, not yet with alarm or distrust, but just alert, feeling the dark set, none of them yet at that point where man looks about at his companions in disaster and thinks, when will I stop trying to save them and save only myself, and not even aware that that point was approaching. And I feel like that's one of the key paragraphs or passages out of the chapter, which gives us some idea about the apocalypse, which will be happening in the future. And then we're also introduced to Charles Bond, his character. In this chapter, we start to see how he is a friend of Henry's, kind of start to get an idea about who he is, where did he come from, that he was with Henry at college and that he was a lot older than the college crowd. He wasn't the normal student at the college. And then the tale of Henry and Judith and Charles Bond is revealed. We start to see that all of a sudden everyone was gone. No one was there. Everyone left. Henry left, Judith was gone, and Charles Bond was gone. And we also start to get an idea about Judith and Charles Bond that they may have had a relationship going. And then we are also told of Mr. Coldfield's death in the chapter, which uh, Dr. Rothman had gone over pretty well about how he was very frightened of the war, didn't like any part of the war, so decided to board himself up into his attic of his shop and house where, him and, um, where he and Miss Rosa lived, decided to board himself up into the attic of that and then have Miss Rosa lift him up food, only later to be found dead in the attic. And then also Miss Rosa talks and says that he was no coward, was no coward, and she sticks to that. And then also, uh, as I had gone over before, that Miss Rosa's character is ex explored by someone other than herself. We start to see from Mr. Thompson, he gives us some ideas about what her character is actually, a different point of view. We don't see such a narrow 
narrow point of view just given by Miss Rosa, we start to see a new point of view. And we can start making some generalizations from that. And then I have some keys that I had found to chapter three. We start to look at Sudfin's past. He comes from the south. He brings a Spanish gold coin with him. He finds his architect in Martinique. The slaves speak French. And at age 14, he is said to set out into the world with a fixed goal. But we have, as of yet, do not know what his fixed goal is. I kind of have an idea, but I don't know for sure yet. And this helps us to see how Faulkner is setting us up for the plot of the novel. This, like I said, he gives us effects before the causes, and then he gives us effects that cry out for the causes. And we have to investigate on our own to find them. And this, particularly this novel, it centers around Sudpins and how his life affects lives around his, his own life. And it gives different narrators who kind of go through Sudpins' life and how it affected them. And then we see the narrators of the novel. The narrators of the novel being Quentin Compson, Miss Rosa Coldfield, and then Mr. Compson, who is the narrator in chapter three. And the narrative is developed without any chronological order. There is no chronological order. We flip from the present time to the past time, to a different past time, back to the present time. There's a lot of switching going on. There's a lot of repetition. A lot of critical data is withheld from us, just specifically to keep us interested in the novel, keep us going, trying to figure out, it's almost like a mystery, trying to figure out how does all this fit? What, how does everybody fit into the novel? And then the narrative uh, structure of it. We have most of the time being present in chapter three. It's most of Mr. Compson talking to Quentin about, in the present time, about the past. So the past is mainly like 1855 through 66, and then with some attention to 1833 through 55. And then he'll jump ahead and give us the past, but it's still, he'll jump ahead and go all the way up to 1869. And if you look in your chronological order of these, that'll help you a lot as far as seeing the different events that occur within those year, that year periods. And then we can look at his style of his work. And some of this, it's kind of funny. I thought of it. I love Faulkner. I mean, I love him. I love him very much. But Faulkner uses very lengthy passages that seem to go. And these are my thoughts. These may not be yours. These may not be yours at all. Please believe me. This is my own nice opinion. And it says, Faulkner uses lengthy passages that seem to go on forever, repeating themselves until the reader seems to say, okay, this is enough, put a period. I can't take it anymore. He uses an explosion of adjectives. He gives lots of adjectives, lots of describing words to you. I like that part. And he deliberately withholds important details, forcing the reader to participate in the search for understanding and truth. And then his syntax is very hard to follow. The units of thought are connected by lots of ands, or buts, or witches, or which, or because in a continued flow of words, he used those continuously. We had read with Dr. Uh, Rothman a passage that had about six that's in it, that just kept going that, and that, and that. And, and so it's hard for us. It's hard for us at times, but if you stick with it and you can do this. We all can do this. We can do it. <laughs> and then I found some memorable quotations that I really enjoyed. And it said, um, this is on page 49 of your book. When he returned home in 66, she had not seen him a hundred times in her whole life. And what she saw then was just that ogre face of her childhood, seen once and then repeated at intervals and on occasions which she could neither count nor recall, like the mask in Greek tragedy, interchangeable, not only from scene to scene, but from actor to actor. 
and behind which the events and occasions took place without chronology, excuse me, chronology, excuse me, or sequence, and leaving her actually incapable of saying how many separate times she had seen him for that reason that waking or sleeping, the Anne had taught her to see nothing else. And then the last one I had just read from you earlier about the apocalypse of the family. And that's a very memorable quote. Read it again? Okay. <laughs> because the time now approached when the destiny of Sudpin's family, which for 20 years now had been like a lake welling from quiet springs into a quiet valley and spreading, rising almost imperceptibly, and in which the four members of it floated in sunny suspension, felt the first subterranean movement toward the outlet, the gorge which would be the land's catastrophe too, and the four peaceful swimmers turning suddenly to face one another, not yet with alarm or distrust, but just alert, feeling the dark set, none of them yet at that point where man looks about at his companions in disaster and thinks, when will I stop trying to save them and save only myself, and not even aware that that point was approaching. And then I also have a critical review of the work. And this is Faulkner actually speaking himself. It says, perhaps Faulkner himself best described the achievement of his style when, speaking of himself and Thomas Wolfe, he declared, we tried to crowd and cram everything, all experience, into each paragraph to get the whole complete nuance of the moment's experience of all recaptured light rays into each paragraph. And I see that a lot in his work. He gives us a lot of information. And then Dr. Uh, Rothman had gone over the greases. And so I had came up with some of my own examples of ones that I had found in the chapter. The first one being government. And this is where the chapter talks about the war going on and Mr. Coldfield hiding in the attic of his store to escape the Confederate soldiers. That was a good example of the government at the time. And how some people just did not want to have anything to do with it, how they were scared of it. And then also of how it was very much white versus black, north versus south. The religion, we start to see, we start, we see the start of Faulkner's statements on religion with the wedding of Sudpin and Ellen. If we look at the wedding, on how it took place. And of all the problems that they had and how no one turned out for the wedding of the town. The economics, the idea of Miss Rosa not knowing how to deal with money when she went shopping allows us to see the division of men and women in the South at the time. Miss Rosa had gone out shopping and she didn't know how to count money. So she would go from store to store and just get what she needed and they would write up a little slip of paper and then good Hugh Coldfield would go behind her and to the merchants because she did not know herself how to count money. And then the aesthetics or the art. We see uh, Faulkner talks about the Greek tragedy in comparison to Sudpin on page 49, where we start to see the different faces in Greek tragedy that a character can take on from action to action. And this is Sudpin. This is him. Science and technology, I do have to say I didn't find one. I tried very hard. But in the chapters to come, there are some good examples. So I'll go on. And in the education, we start to see how the young men, such as Henry and Charles Bond, go on to college, but there's no mention of Judith going to college. And then also, like Miss Rose's, education is very substandard in, in uh, accordance with the men's education. And then also the social behavior. The men clearly are the dominant force, except in the case of Mr. Coldfield and the aunt, who we see is basically the father and the mother of Miss Rosa. And then there's also the case of the arranged marriage of Ellen to Sudpin. That was not under Ellen's own ideas to marry Sudpin. It was basically Sudpin saying, I would like to marry your daughter and talking to Mr. Coldfield about it. And so, um, again, I would say that please keep 
pressing on with this novel. It, it, it comes to you, and I've gone on in the uh, next chapters to come, and it does start getting easier, but you do have to realize that this is just Faulkner style. This is what he does. He leaves out, you know, and again, like in his don't, instead of putting a nice little apostrophe, he just leaves that out completely, and that is his style. He was very different. He wasn't the norm of a novelist. He was very much different, and that was his own style, his own personal style. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chillick, for very, very informative, detailed, and thorough presentation. Following up the statement with the greases is appreciated. Those of you who are writing the short paper for this course can take one of those subjects, can take government or religion or economics or art or science and use that as the focus for your paper. And the first thing you will do, of course, will be to isolate the episodes you want to cover. That will be the first part of your paper. Then the second part of your paper will be a study of the central motifs. And the third part of the paper will be a demonstration of how these ideas apply in your experience or how they apply to contemporary events, and that would be the short paper. I don't think that uh, Ms. Chillick said Faulkner gets easier as you read it. No, Faulkner remains difficult. You get better. And that's, the, that's your achievement. So Faulkner will always be complex, but your ability to read him becomes more informed, more incisive, and uh, certainly are more coherent. I'd like now to focus on two chapters, chapters 4 and chapters uh, 5. Chapter 4 really is a focus on uh, the experience and the relationship between Charles Bond and Henry. Chapter 5 is Rosa Coldfield's experience when she has to go to the mansion, Sutpen's Hundred, and where she has to discover, uh, work out the death of Charles Bond and then her rela the relationship with Thomas Sutpen, who wants to marry her, or allegedly wants to marry her. So these two chapters, again, begin to repeat the events. But, but as you well understand, we now hear these events again and again, but in considerable more detail. So let's look at chapter 4. I call it Compson's chapter. Compson is really telling Quentin much of what's happening. And Quentin is going to drive with Rosa to Sutpen's Hundred in 1909. And this, of course, is where they discover Henry. Compson says that there is a heroic people. And he goes right into a discussion of how Thomas Sutpen drove to New Orleans because he knew that Charles Bunn, this sophisticated, this, uh, uh, this sophisticated individual, this man who had seduced his son, seduced his daughter, inveigled himself into the family, and now was going to marry. Thomas Sutpen knew he looked familiar, but he had to go 600 miles to New Orleans in order to re-examine and investigate Charles Bond's background. And it's then, of course, that he tells Henry, and Henry realizes that Charles Bond cannot marry Judith. The nature of the discovery, we realize, 
that Judith herself discovers in Bond's pocket, pocket at his death a picture of his wife and child from New Orleans. So he is a bigamist, willing to marry her, willing to undermine the family. Not only that, but the issue is one of miscegenation. And Faulkner tells us that the black blood coming into the family would pollute the white blood that is part of the family, creating this situation that Thomas Sutton seeks to prevent, and he seeks to prevent the marriage in 1960. It is delayed four years, and any decision is delayed four years because of the Civil War. But Charles Bunn is a rather seductive figure, and I want you to read, the, I'll read that passage for you, and you get some idea on page 74 of how uh, Faulkner handles this description. He says, he had that fatalistic and impenetrable imperturbability with which he watched them while he waited for them to do whatever it would be that they would do as if he had known all the while that the occasion would arrive when he would have to wait, and that all he would need to do would be to wait, that he had seduced Henry and Judith both too thoroughly to have any fear that he might not marry Judith when he wished to. So if we had a villain to the novel, it would be Charles, or for the inner novel, it would be Charles Bond, certainly not Thomas Sutton, Sutton's the protagonist, Bun would be the antagonist. Then the novel moves on to life at the University of Mississippi. Now, the University of Mississippi, as other universities of the time, in the 1850s, is not a place with 12,000 students and 400 students in law school. In fact, we find very, very few students, maybe six to eight in a law school class. But Henry has gone to the University of Mississippi. Why he went to Missi the Mississippi uh, region is perhaps the influence of Charles Bond, perhaps the fact that he didn't want to go north. Most of the uh, university age students would go to north if they were affluent. They'd go up to Harvard and they'd go up to Columbia. But Henry chose to stay at the University of Mi Mississippi, and there he is there he is friendly and part of a, uh, the coterie that Charles Bond lives with. And we see the metamorphosis of Charles Bond. We realize that he is a sexual figure, that he wishes to seduce women. And, of course, Faulkner says, the wonder is that so many people would allow their, stu their daughters to go to the University of Mississippi, or perhaps uh, any university, to lose their virginity. Then, once they become buddies, Charles, Bunn, and Henry, Charles comes back to Sutpen's Hundred, where he meets Judith. And it's at that point that Sutpen decides to go to New Orleans to find out who is this Charles Bunn. He looks familiar, and he certainly resembles people whom he knows. Charles Bond is in law school with six others beside Henry. And while they're in law school after Christmas vacation, Judith is in Memphis buying herself wedding clothes. And it's a very delightful scene. She's involved in women's activities, women's interests. They're at school, but really not at school. In fact, uh, Faulkner tells us that they're traveling a lot. School days for Charles Bond and for Henry are days for entertainment, days for drinking, days for womanizing. In June, after the year, Henry and Bond return to Sutpen's Hundred, where uh, Ellen is now engineering the courtship. She knows nothing about Charles Bond and his relationship, and she's not told it. Faulkner tells us, the father, who is the natural enemy of any son and son-in-law, of whom the mother is the ally. So the father doesn't want his daughter to be taken. 
A mother who wants him, her to get married. Just as after the wedding, the father will be the ally of the actual son-in-law who has for his mortal foe the mother of his wife. Very psychological. And I think people will agree that this is, happens even today. Letters are carried between Henry and Bonn by Henry's groom. And it's in New Orleans where Henry visits that we realize how puritanical is his existence. In fact, in New Orleans, Charles Bond introduces Henry to drinking, introduces him to women, introduces him to brothels, and this becomes part of his college experience, the deflowering of as many virgins as one can find as part of the experience of uh, their liaison. We he read of Bond's corruption of Henry. I can imagine how he did it. The calculation, the surgeon's alertness and cold detachment, the exposure's brief, so brief as to be cryptic, almost staccato. The plate, unaware of what the complete picture would show, scarce seen yet ineradicable, a trap. You see, Bond is trying to get insinuate himself into Henry's company. A trap, a riding horse standing before a closed and curiously monastic doorway in a neighborhood, a little decadent, even a little sinister, and Bond mentioning the owner's name casually, the corruption subtly anew by putting into Henry's mind the notion of one man of the world speaking to another. He's not in with these, but Bond knows how to bring him to these houses. Bunn knows how to find the women he wants. That Henry knew that Bunn believes that Henry would know, even from a disjointed world, what Bunn was talking about. This convoluted language simply says, Bunn knows something that Henry doesn't, and Henry's trying to figure out what Bunn knows, and his mind's running in these convoluted fashions. And Henry the Puritan, who must show nothing at all, rather than surprise or incomprehension, a facade shuttered and blank, drowsing in steamy morning sunlight, invested by the bland and cryptic voice with something of secret and curious and unimaginable delights. These become the whorehouses that they visit. We turn to pages 88 to 89. We realize that there is a certain ambience of southern cordiality and that Bonn is showing it to Henry, and Henry has to learn it. What is Henry? Henry's going to learn this life. He's the country boy with his simple and erstwhile untroubled code in which females were ladies or whores or slaves, looked at the apotheosis of two doomed races presided over by its own victim, a woman with a face like a tragic magnolia, the eternal female, the eternal who suffers, the whores, the prostitutes. But Bun doesn't want him to call these ladies whores. He says, don't call them whores because of those who would defend them. There are people who would defend the reputation. There are people who won't allow you to do that. That is, few enough of them will engage in unions and marriages with white men. That is, treat them as ladies. Treat them with respect. Treat them with cordiality. Some few of them will actually marry into this white world. The war and Henry's hope create four years of change. And that interrupts this plan that Bonn has to seduce Judith. Judith is in love with Bonn. We find this in page... 96. Let's turn to that and look at it. Judith giving implicit trust where she had given love, giving implicit love where she had derived breath and pride. We're in the middle of 90s, page 96.
that true pride, not that false kind which transforms what it does not at the moment understand into scorn and outrage and so vents itself in peak and lacerations, but true pride which can say to itself without abasement, I love, I will accept no substitute. Something has happened between him and my father. If my father was right, I will never see him again. If wrong, he will come or send for me. If happy I can be, I will. If suffer, I must, I can. And you get Judith with her ambivalence discovering what's happened. Henry and Charles's life at the University of Mississippi continues. The spectacle of so many virgins going to be sacrificed to some heathen principle, some Priapus. Priapus is the goddess of fertility. Uh, statues of Priapus were discovered at Herculaneum Herculaneum and Pompeii, and they would be set out on a woman's toilet table uh, as <coughs> signs of uh, fruition. And the statues were obviously phallic in imagery, and the women at night would take their bracelets and put them away on Priapus. You had the sight of young men the light, quick bones, the bright, gallant, diluted blood and flesh, dressed in martial glitter of brass and plumes, finally marching away to battle. Now the war comes. And in 1960, we are told that Sutpin is going to stop the wedding. But now he can wait four years because everyone's gone off to war. sutpin has gone off to war, and so has Charles Bunn, and so has Henry with commissions. Judith is lonely. We discover that Sutpin's Negroes were the first Yankee troops. Sutpin's Negroes left with the first Yankee trips, troops to pass through Jefferson. And Wash Jones and his daughter Millicent moved to the shack in Sutpin's Hundred during the war years. Page 99, we get the impression of what the women of Jefferson are doing with the wounded. At the bottom of the page. Um, there were wounded in Jefferson then, in the improved hospital where the nurtured virgin, the supremely and traditionally idle, that is, maidens, spinsters, and others now, cleaned and dressed and, self, and, and handled the self-fouled bodies of strange, injured, and dead, and they made lint of the window curtains and sheets and linen and from the houses where they had been born, all to take care of these wounded, self-fouled wounded, these people unable to rise from the bed, the odors penetrating, the war scenes unromantic, nothing here glorious about war in Faulkner's work, work even though people leave proudly. So many have died that when the war ends, the women worry about who their loves will be. In 1862, we have the death of Ellen Coldfield and the death of Goodhue Coldfield that Miss Chillick has spoken about. In 1865, of course, we have the traumatic event of the death of Charles Bond, when Henry, who has learned that Charles Bond is black and that he is also uh, an incestuous relationship can only prevent Charles from seducing Judith by shooting him. And that's the way the war ends for the Sutpin family. Not only has Sutpin lost his slaves, uh, the Negroes, not only has, he, has the house gone into ruin, but of course he loses his son, who kills his other son, and loses his daughter, who now goes into a great depression because her love has been killed. So the marriage, the family is, is falling apart. And when I began this session, I said that Faulkner's image of the South is one of deconstruction, not construction. Judith has a letter that she reads. And she's trying to reconcile herself to the fact that her love is dead. And here's what she says. Read it if you like. or. 
Don't read it if you like. Because you make so little impression, you see. She's talking about herself, about everybody. You get born, and you try this. And you don't know why, only you keep on trying it, and you are born at the same time with a lot of other people, all mixed up with them, like trying to, having to, move your arms and legs with strings, only the same strings are hitched to all the other arms and legs, and the others all trying. And they don't know why either, except that the strings are all in one another's way, like five or six people, all trying to make a rug on the same loom, only each wants to weave his own pattern into the ring. And it can't matter, you know that. Or the ones that set up the loom would have arranged things a little better. And yet it must matter because you keep on trying or having to keep on trying. And then all of a sudden it's all over. We're on page one. She says, it's all of a sudden it's all over. Life is over. And all you have left is a block of stone. What block of stone would you have that's all that you left? Gravestone. Gravestone, right. All you have left is a block of stone with scratches on it. That's what she calls the epitaph. Provided there was someone to remember to have the marble scratched and set up, or had time to, and it rains on it, and the sun shines on it, and after a while they don't even remember the name and what the scratches were trying to tell. And it doesn't matter. And that's Judith and her depression. Quentin is littering, is listening to Rosa tell the story, or to Compson tell the story, so to Compson tell the story. The letter that was read was from Charles Bond to Judith. And upon the return from the war, we have the confrontation at the front gate. And Wash Jones runs to Rosa Caulfield, and what did she say? Hey, you, Rosie Caulfield, then you better come on out, Jan. Henry has done, shot that down, French fellow. Killed him dead as a babe. And that's the way the chapter ends. So that the chapter that began with all these details, the details of the Culler's life, the details of Bonza's efforts to seduce Henry and finally to win Judith as his wife, the efforts of Sutpen to go to Los Orleans to find the identity of Charles Bond, the Civil War and the end of the Civil War all finally culminate in a different war, a war that lasted four years silently and that ends in this one great mortal act, the death of Charles Bond. In reality, the death of Henry. Now, chapter five moves to a different situation. Ross has been called to Sutpen's Hundred. What kind of place is it now? Who has survived? What does the house look like after four years of civil war and Thomas Sutpen's absence? What does it look like when people were trying to run the house without Negroes, without the plantation help normally needed? What is Thomas Sutpen going to do? His wife has died during the war. He is still a man of great sexual energy. And he wants to make love. And he will make love, but not to Rosa Coldfield, but to Wash Jones' daughter and Wash Jones' granddaughter. It's interesting the way this chapter begins. It's entirely in italics. It's the only chapter in the novel entirely in italics. And why, why we put Rosa's in italics? It's certainly a past memory. But perhaps it's in italics because Faulkner wants to give us this idea of movement, speed. Let's see what happens. Rosa decides to transport herself to Sutpen's Hundreds. It's a logical move for her. After all, she's wearing Ellen Coldfield's clothing. Ellen had given her a lot of clothing. 
and she had gotten it from her aunt, that aunt who tried to help the wedding along. Rosa, I remember, is 19 years old when she comes to Sutton Penthouse. She, she, while she is a sister of Ellen Coldfield, she is much younger. She was born very much later. And she leaves when she's 20. By the way, this is a reverse of the biblical image. In the Bible, if a man dies leaving a wife and widows, then the man's brother, if he's unmarried, is supposed to marry. In this case, Sutpin's wife has died, and so his sister logically should marry him. There's a biblical analogy that is rather interesting. It works. But we find out very early that Rosa hates Sutpin now. As she looks back 43 years later, she hates Thomas Sutpin, that brute progenitor of brutes. Let's look at that. Whose granddaughter was to supplant me, if not in my sister's house, at least in my sister's bed, to which, so they will tell you, I aspired. She wanted to marry. It's her last chance to marry. And yet when she realizes that Thomas Sutpin is sleeping with his slaves, also wants to sleep with her, wants to sleep with her before the wedding, then the insult is too great to bear. Rosa proceeds to Sutpin's house. And Rosa has a memory. What is her memory? Her memory is of Judith with her unfinished wedding dress and her brother bursting into the room after Charles Bunn has been shot. Rosa's nephew had just murdered her sister's fiancé. What a realization. Rosa's nephew had murdered her sister's fiancé. <coughs> what does Sutton's Hundred look like in this chapter 5? It has a rotting portico. Now here's you get the, here you get the Gothic imagery in Faulkner's work. It has a rotting portico and scaling walls. It stood not ravaged, not invaded, marked by no bullet nor soldier's iron heel, but rather as though reserved for something more some desolation more profound than ruin, as if it had stood in iron juxtaposition to iron flame, to a holocaust which had found itself less fierce and less implacable, not hurled, but rather fallen back before the impervious and indomitable skeleton which the flames durst not at the instant's final crisis assail. This is Sutpin's Hundred. Here, look, look what else. Look at more of the description of this house that has been ravaged by time during the war and when no one lived in it. The barren hall with its naked stair, that carpet gone too, rising into the dim upper hallway where an echo spoke, which was not mine, but rather than of the lost irrevocable might have been which haunts all houses, all enclosed walls erected by human hands, not for shelter, not for warmth, but to hide from the world, curious looking and seeing the dark turnings which the ancient young delusions of pride and hope and ambition I and love to take. Look at the past calamities in the present. And this is on page 10. We see a reference to that bedroom. This is where Ellen slept with Thomas Sutpen, and now no one to sleep in it. That bedroom, long closed and musty, that sheetless bed, that nuptial couch of love and grief with a pale and bloody corpse in its patched and weathered gray, crimsoning the bare mattress, that's now we see who's lying there. Who's now on the couch? Who's lying there in a Confederate gray uniform, crimsoning the bare mattress, making it blood red. Charles Bond, the bowed and the unwived widow, the unwived widow kneeling beside it. Look what he does with his prefixes. There's no such word as unwived. 
But if anyone has not is a widow without being a wife, it is Judith Coldfield, an unwived widow. Rosa runs up the stairs to help Judith, and Clytie's standing in front of her, the black slave. And she says, take your hand off me, nigger. And she realizes she said the wrong thing. But there's a relationship between Rosa, who was born in 1845, and Clytemnestra, born in 1834. And Clytemnestra's face looks like something. So here she's talking to her half-sister, you see? And she realizes that. And we realize it because Rosa at one time says that the three of them are together, Judith, Clyde, and herself. And they form a bond. And this chapter deals with the bond that forms between these three suckings. Rosa goes back to an idyllic age when she was 14. That's when things were perfect. When she was 19, she hoped to be married. When she was 20, she became a spinch for the rest of her life. She has no marriage. And that's what she regrets. And for 43 years, her hatred for Sutpen grows, grows and enlarges because he deprived her of the life that she had thought she would get from him and that she deserved in her lifetime. Turn to page 115. And you get this idyllic age that she describes. She says, once there was, they cannot have told you this either, a summer of wisteria. It was a pervading everywhere of wisteria. I was 14 then, as though of all springs, yet to capitulate condensed into one spring, one summer. The spring and summertime, which is every female's who breathe above dust, beholden of all betrayed springs, held over from all irrevocable time, repercussed, bloomed again. It was a vintage year of wisteria, vintage year being that sweet conjunction of root bloom and urge and hour and weather. And I, I was 14. I will not insist on bloom at whom no man had yet to look, no whatever twice, as not as a child, but less than even child, as not more child than woman, but even as less than any female flesh. She says, but root and urge I do insist and claim. For had I not erred to, from all the unsistered eaves since the snake? Now, how would you translate that? Had I not erred to, from all the unsistered eaves since the snake? Sexuality was part of her life. And she describes when she was 14. Then she talks about her age and her relationship to Judith. Judith is four years older than she is. All I knew of that light in space in which people moved and breathed as I. That same child might have gained a conception of the sun from seeing it through a piece of smoky glass. You see things a little foggy. Fourteen. Four years younger than Judith. Four years later than Judith moment which only virgins know. She knows what Judith would have experienced. But now the years have gone past. And the chapter begins to discuss the relationship between Rosa and Thomas Sutpin. She asks, how could Judith have loved Bon? And we go back to the fact of 
of this death. And Rosa begins to talk. If we want to discuss religion, we wonder where it is in this novel. She says this. And we're turning to page one, nine, 118. Turn to page 118, you'll find the passage. If I were God, I would invent out of this seething turmoil we call progress something, a machine perhaps, which would adorn the barren mirror altars of every plain girl who breathes with such as this, which is so little since we want so little, this pictured face. It would not even need a skull behind it, almost anonymous. It would only need vague inferences of some shadow realm of make-believe. She would like to have love. And then she goes back. She keeps going back to Charles Bond, who was her Judas, who was Judith's love. Remember, she's living with Judith. She's living with Clyde. The images will go back and forth in stream of consciousness. She begins to contemplate Charles Bond and thinks of his name. Bond means good. Charles Bond. Charles good. Charles husband soon to be. And on page 119, we have... Faulkner's brilliant picture of what love is. The bottom of page 119. She says, Yes, child, enough to go and say, Let me sleep with you. Woman enough to say, Let us lie in bed together while you tell me what love is. Yet who did not do it, because I should have had to say, don't talk to me of love, but let me tell you who know already more of love than you will ever know or need. Chapter 5 moves back and forth. We get on page 120, The Vividness of War. The Maelstrom. The four years, while I believe she waited as I waited, while the stable world, the stable world we'd been taught to know, dissolved in fire and smoke until peace and security were gone and pride and hope, and there was left only maimed honors veterans and love yes there should there must be love and faith these left with us by fathers now remember who has died these love and faith which we remember have been left to us by fathers husbands sweethearts brothers who carried the pride and the hope of peace in honors vanguard as they did the flags for what else worth dying for the world, the war is not romanticized in uh, Absalom and uh, uh, Absalom, Absalom. We see coffins being built. And here we have a coffin being built for Charles Bond. The construction of the coffin, the slow, maddening rasp, rasp, rasp of the saw, the flat, deliberate hammer blows that seemed as though each would be the last but was not, repeated and resumed just when the dulled attenuation of the wearied nerves stretched beyond all resiliency, relaxed to silence, and then had to scream again the rest of the saw. Charles Bonn is buried as a soldier. He's a Catholic, but there's no time for a Catholic burial. And the implication is that he is buried secretively somewhere at Sutpen's Hundred, because no one comes looking for the arrest of Henry Sutpen. We have no information in this novel about Henry Sutpen's being sought. Who knows that this death has occurred? Charles Bunn was a visitor. He was a alien. He dressed in fine clothing. He spoke in articulate French. 
but he had black and white blood, and therefore no one will miss him. And where is he buried? This is it. For all I was allowed to know, says Rosa, we had no corpse. We even had no murderer. We did not even speak of Henry that day, not one of us. I did not say, the aunt, the spinster, did he look well or ill? I did not say one of the thousand trivial things which the indomitable woman blood ignores, the man's world, in which the blood kinsman shows the courage or cowardice, the folly or lust or fear for which his fellows praise or crucify him. There is no body. Now, <clears throat> Rosa is going to stay. Her reasons for staying. There are three nuns in the house, she says. Remember, Bond's Catholic? He carries the analogy. There are three nuns in the house, Clyde, Judith, and Rosa. Not as two white women and a negress, not as three negroes or three whites, not even as three women, but merely three creatures who still possessed the need to eat, but took no pleasure in it, the need to sleep, but from no joy and weariness or regeneration, and whom sex was some forgotten atrophy, like the rudimentary gills we call the tonsils. Sex, some atrophied thing, like rudimentary gills, like our tonsils. Seven months pass, and Thomas Sutpin comes back. Sutpin, the waiting, grim, decaying bombast of a madman who creates within his very coffin, who, who creates within his very coffin walls his fabulous, immeasurable Camelots. Does he still have his dreams after all this? Yes, he has. Sutpin, we discover, his was that cold, alert fury of the gambler who knows that he may lose anyway, but that with the seconds flagging of the fierce constant will he is sure to and who keeps suspense from every quite crystallizing by sheer fierce manipulation of the cards or dice until the ducks and glands of luck begin to flow again. He's going to play his cards. He's going to play them out. He did not pause, did not take that day or two to let the bones and flesh of 59, recuperate, he's 59 years old now. And now he's, his blood is moving and his sexuality is still alive. He has new plans. Well, even while developments grow against the carpetbaggers, even though militants like the KKK seem to arise, Rosa says, I watched the miragey antics of men and women, my father, my sister, Thomas Sutpin, Judith, Henry, Charles Bunn, called honor, principle, marriage, love, bereavement, death. It's all a sequence of events as she sees her family going through the throes of this agony. On page 133, we look. Thomas Sutpin proposes to Rosa, and he offers a self-imposed engagement during the three period three-month period of his return. Then he leaves for two months. But Rosa discovers that he is not going to embrace her. He is not going to marry her. And at that point, she chooses to leave. She is anger at his deception, his duplicity, his multiple loves, his aberrant sexuality. And she says, my presence was to him only the absence of black morass and snarled vine and creeper to that man who had struggled through a swamp with nothing to guide or drive him, no hope, no light, only some incorrigibility of undefeat. This is him. Rosa remembers him as an ogre. Rosa realizes, and we see this on page 136, that Thomas Sutpin is her only hope for marriage. But Rosa is insulted. Sutpin wants her to bear his child without marriage. He had not even waited to tether his horse.
and Rosa leaves. Her hopes of marriage gone. And 43 years ahead of her, of the discovery of the sadness of the family and the tragedy of Sutpen Hundred. If Faulkner is difficult to read, it's because he is trying to invoke a stream of, a stream of consciousness, and you are part of the conscious perception that he is trying to understand. Okay, we'll next week continue with the last chapters of Absalom, Absalom, and see how much further we must peel this cabbage to get finally to the core of the story. <laughs>